There's only one God. <laughs> Let's go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 through verse 10. You know, this is such a powerful message. In uh, the year 2000, I took a trip to Nigeria. Nigeria is the, the most populated country of Africa. And I began teaching seminars for ministers of every denomination. And uh, we, I've been there, let me see, four times. I've taught a number of seminars and uh, taught to hundreds of preachers. Uh, of various groups, independents, and we've seen over 1,500 preachers baptized in Jesus' name. Praise God. And many have gone and baptized their entire congregations. This last time in April of this year, I went to a Baptist Bible college in Nigeria, and I taught about the restoration of the apostolic church about baptism in Jesus name receiving the Holy Spirit and already a number of those students have been baptized in Jesus name and uh, many of them are already pastoring churches so God is moving all across this world in wonderful ways so we should uh, not be ashamed of this mess of people we if they have some knowledge of God or relationship with God we need to uh, affirm that and say that's good but there's more for you and uh, show them what the Bible has to say. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 through verse 10. I want to talk about the identity of Jesus Christ. Of course, we've already begun to talk about that, but Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. The word spoil means to, like an army spoiling a city, a, a, a stripping you, taking everything from you, taking away your weapons, taking away your belongings. So be careful because if you follow the traditions of men or you follow the philosophy of men, you could lose everything. All the truth can be taken from you. What is the truth? Well, verse 9, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Here's the truth about Jesus Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then verse 10 goes on to say, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. But verse 9, let's look at it carefully. It says, For in him. Him is referring back to the previous verse, Christ. Or you can go back to verse 6, Christ Jesus the Lord. That's the full reference. It's talking about Jesus. It says the, it uses the word bodily. Christ had a true human identity. It's very important to believe that Jesus was a true human being. If Jesus was not a true human, then he could not be the sacrifice for our sins. He could not take our place. He had a complete humanity. Whatever we humans have, Jesus had that, except for sin, as I've already mentioned. Now, I don't believe that he had a spirit separate from God, but I believe there was both deity and humanity joined in his one spirit. So I don't think you can divide Christ into two persons. He was only one person, but there was both deity and humanity. I'll just quickly give you some examples. Um, when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Is, that's a human experience. And on the cross, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. That's a human experience. So he was feeling a human experience in his soul, a human experience in his spirit. Now, I'm not saying it was, a, it was separated from God. Even when he cried on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was a human experience. I don't believe the Spirit of God left him at that moment because when the Spirit of God left him, the body died. I don't think Jesus could live as a separate person without God. 
because he was God. At the moment that he was giving his life for, my, for our sins, he was still God manifest in the flesh. It wasn't just a man who was our Savior. It was God manifest in the flesh who was our Savior. But when he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was feeling the same way a sinner will feel in the lake of fire. He was taking on the punishment for our sins. You see, we're going to die physically unless the Lord comes for the church first. But what is the death that we're saved from? It's spiritual death, eternal death in the lake of fire. We will never experience that because Jesus took it for us. And he took it on the cross. He was feeling the weight of the sins. He was feeling that awfulness of punishment of a sinner in the lake of fire. And so he cried out. Just as he cried on the cross, I thirst. Now, does God get thirsty? No. So how could Jesus cry out, I thirst? It was a human experience. The Spirit of God did not protect him from that human experience, but let him feel it. The same way when he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Does that mean God's Spirit left him? No, it means God's Spirit did not protect him, but let him feel the full punishment, the full human suffering. We have to understand he was a true man in every way in order to be able to take our place. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So he was not just the appearance of a man, he was a true man. Now, it also says the Godhead bodily. He was truly God. You know, only as a man could he die for us and be our Savior. But only as God does he have the power and authority to be our Savior. He had to be both God and man at the same time in order to save us. Think about it this way. If he was only a man, a sinless man, but only a man, could he have died for the whole world? No. You might think of him dying for one person, but how could he die for the whole world? Because he was not just a man. He was the infinite God. And so when he experienced that human death, he could do it for everyone at the same time. And he could take our punishment for eternity because you, when you place that punishment on the infinite God, it is sufficient for the sins of the whole human race for all of eternity. So we must confess him as a true human in order for him to be our Savior, but we must also confess him as true God in order for him to be our Savior. He had to be both at the same time. So the Godhead bodily. Now, when we say Godhead, that's a very unusual word in Greek. It means everything that makes God who he is. It's the total of God's character, his attributes, his identity. We might call it Godhood, just as we say manhood. You know, manhood is whatever makes you a man. Well, Godhood is whatever makes him God. Now, think about this. Godhood or Godhead would include being perfect, right? If God is not perfect, he wouldn't be God. So a part of what it means to be God is he is perfect. He is complete. He does not lack anything. So the Godhead, you cannot add anything to the Godhead, can you? Because if you could add something, it wasn't complete. You cannot take away anything from the Godhead. Because if you take something away, it wouldn't be God. So the very uh, meaning of Godhead includes completeness, perfection. Nothing can be added. Nothing can be taken away. So when the Bible says Jesus is the Godhead bodily, that one word Godhead tells you he cannot be a junior God or a demigod or part of God because you cannot divide the Godhead. The Godhead is complete. So to say Jesus is the Godhead bodily means he is the true God of Israel in all of his completion, in all of his perfection. Now, notice there is another word, the fullness of the Godhead. Actually, the way I've explained it, the word fullness is not strictly necessary because the word Godhead already contains the concept of fullness. 
But this word is added to make sure we understand. If you could think the Godhead could be divided, if you could think the Godhead could be diminished, well then, stop that thinking because He is the fullness of the Godhead. There it makes it clear. He's not a lesser deity. He's not an emanation from God or a part of God or an agent of God or a junior God. He is the fullness of God. Now in case that's not enough, there is another word. All. Now the word fullness includes the word all. If the glass is full, you cannot add anything more to it. But in Him dwells all the fullness. Just to emphasize the point, the Scripture is using three words where just one would be enough. It's kind of like hammering a nail. In Him dwells all. Boom. The fullness. Boom. Of the Godhead. Boom. Just hitting it one more time to make sure it gets in there and stays in there and doesn't come out. To un so that we will understand that Jesus is the revelation of all the fullness of the Godhead. That means everything that God is, Jesus is. Any name or title that we can apply to God, we can apply to Jesus. If God is the Savior, Jesus is the Savior. If God is the healer, Jesus is the healer. Whatever God is, Jesus is. And in fact, you can go through the Old Testament and you find all the titles of God and you can find that they're all given to Jesus in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God is the first and the last. In the New Testament, Jesus is the first and the last. The Old Testament, the Lord is my shepherd. In the New Testament, Jesus is the good shepherd. In the Old Testament, the Lord is my light and my salvation. In the New Testament, Jesus is the light of the world. And Jesus is the Savior. In the Old Testament, Jehovah is all of these things. The rock, uh, the, the uh, king, the um, and on and on we could go. But in the New Testament, Jesus is all of these things. And so it is right to say that Jesus is the Son of God. It is also right to say Jesus is God. Both titles are very valuable, very important. Now let's talk about Son of God a little bit more. I already mentioned to you from Luke chapter 135 that this refers to God as He is manifested in the flesh. The Bible does not use the term son for eternal deity, but it always uses the term son for the incarnation. The Bible never says God the son. It always says the son of God. The Bible never says eternal son. It says the only begotten son. The son had a beginning. Now the spirit of Jesus did not have a beginning, but the son referring to the incarnation, had a beginning. You can see this in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, Galatians 4, 4, When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. God is eternal, but the Son was made of a woman, made under the law. Son had a beginning at a certain point in time. All right? So when we say <clears throat> that Jesus is the Son of God, we mean He is begotten by God's Spirit. We're talking about Him being born according to the flesh. Now, when we say the Son, it does not mean the flesh only, but it means God manifests in the flesh. Now, sometimes it's referring to something that only the flesh can do. As, for example, it says the death of his son. Obviously, only a human can die. Spirit cannot die. So when the Bible speaks of the death of the son, that's a very obvious example. It's referring to the flesh. But Jesus said, the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. Uh, the son of man will come. You'll see the son of man coming in the clouds of glory. Does that mean... Be just just the flesh? No. It means God as He is manifested in the flesh. So the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Who was forgiving sins? Jesus standing there before them visibly, physically. He had the power of God, therefore He was able to forgive sins. But He wasn't forgiving sins just as a spirit. He was forgiving sins 
in the flesh before them. When Jesus comes back in the clouds, it won't be just as a man. It will be as with the power of God. But yet, it won't be an invisible spirit. It will be the visible body of Jesus. So the term son is not limited to flesh. The term son refers to the one person of Jesus who is both God and man at the same time. But what I'm saying is the term son always includes the flesh. In other words, it always refers to the incarnation. It cannot speak just of spirit only, but only the spirit as incarnated in flesh. And that's the scriptural use of the term son. So when we confess Jesus is the son of God, that's very important because we're confessing he's a true man who died for our sins. And without Jesus being a true man, we have no salvation. So we should proclaim and preach that Jesus is the Son of God. That's a very beautiful oneness truth, that Jesus is the Son of God. In fact, one of the oneness pioneers, Bishop G.T. Haywood, uh, I don't know if you know or sing the song, but he wrote a beautiful song, Jesus the Son of God. Oh, sweet wonder. Oh, sweet wonder, Jesus the Son of God. And that should be a very precious truth. At the same time, we understand, and it's right to say Jesus is God. Because the Bible does say that as well. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Go back to the prophecies of the Old Testament. We find Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. A prophecy of the birth of Christ. It says that a virgin will conceive and bear a son and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. And you know what Emmanuel means? God with us. And you can read it in, in uh, Matthew one twenty three. It gives the translation. God with us. So the son is more than a son. The son is also God with us Isaiah chapter 9 in verse 6 for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given the government shall be upon his shoulder his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty God the everlasting father the prince of peace notice Isaiah 9 6 the child is more than a child he's also the mighty God the son is more than a son He's also the everlasting Father. So Jesus is not only Son of God, but He is God. John chapter 20 is one of the most powerful statements of this. After the resurrection of Jesus, perhaps you remember the story, He appeared to His disciples and Thomas was not present, so Thomas didn't believe. He said, I won't believe unless I see Him for myself and see the nail prints in His hand touch them so then Jesus appeared again to his disciples and this time Thomas was present Jesus said all right Thomas come touch me see for yourself well of course Thomas recognized Jesus and so he fell down and made this confession in John chapter 20 verse 20 and Thomas answered and said unto him my Lord and my God. Now here's a direct statement that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is God. I've heard many people try to explain this away, but there's no good explanation. I've heard some say, oh, Thomas was just making an exp expression of surprise. My God. But that would be taking God's name in vain. I hope none of you do that. He, he wouldn't do that. And I've heard some say, oh, he was looking at Jesus. He said, my Lord. And he looked up to heaven, my God. <laughs> Obviously, they're trying to avoid the meaning of the Scripture here. But Jesus was making this confession looking at Jesus. Thomas was making this confession looking at Jesus. And remember, Thomas was trained as a Jew from childhood. There's only one God. There's only one Lord. He's the only one you should worship. 
So when Thomas made that confession, it wasn't just like a pagan saying, we're going to add Jesus to the list of the gods. It was a Jew saying, he is the one God of the Old Testament, my Lord and my God. Now, what was the response of Jesus? He said, Thomas, you are blessed because you've seen me and you've believed. But also blessed are those who do not see and yet they believe. So he accepted the confession of Thomas. Now notice, if Jesus was not truly Lord and God, he should not have accepted that. He should have said, as, as the angels did and the elders did in the Revelation, Oh, don't worship me. Worship God. But he accepted it. And that's why maybe you've read C.S. Lewis said that you, we cannot just accept Jesus as a good man or a prophet or something like that. We must accept him for who he said he was and who the people claimed him to be, or we must reject him altogether. And so the saying is he's either liar or lunatic or Lord. He's either, you know, if I stand up here and say, I am God, you're going to say I'm a liar. Or you're going to say I'm crazy and I need to go to a mental institution, right? You can't just say, oh, he's a wonderful teacher. He's a great man. He, he says he's God and he's really not, but hey, he's a wonderful holy man. You can't say that. He's a very wise man. He just has this slight misunderstanding. No, you can't say that. For someone to say, I'm God, that's a very strong claim. Or even someone else to say, you are God, and, and you say, well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> that's a pretty strong statement. So either you must say he's a liar, he knows what he's saying is false, and he says it anyway, or he's a lunatic, he doesn't know what he's saying, and he's crazy. Or you would have to say he's right. So if we're going to accept Jesus at all, we must accept him for who Thomas said and for who Jesus claimed to be, my Lord and my God. And notice, when he said, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet they believe, he's talking about us. Because we've never seen Jesus according to the flesh. But we make the same confession that Thomas made. My Lord and my God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, if you study the book of John, I don't have time to go into it. It's a very beautiful book. The purpose of that book is to show who Jesus really is. God manifest in flesh, the Son of God, to be our Savior. And in John 1, he, he gives you a preview. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. John 1.1. 1, 1. And then John 1.14, and the Word was made flesh. And I'll just say this briefly. Word means God in self-revelation. God in self-revelation. God revealing Himself. So when it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. Not as another person. Just like my word is not a different person from me. But my word is my expression. Before I speak the word, I have to think the word, right? So the word is in my mind before it's ever spoken. So in the beginning was the word. God's mind. God's thought. The word was with God. His mind, his thought, his plan was with God. And the word was God. So, the Word was God Himself. And then when it says the Word was made flesh, that means God revealed Himself in flesh. If you go back to John 1.1, 1, 1, the Trinitarians have a really hard time with this verse because, you know, what they like to do is they like to change the definition of God in the middle of the verse. Notice, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. If you ask a Trinitarian, who is God? They might say, the Trinity. You say, okay, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with the Trinity, and the Word was the Trinity. Is that what you believe? No. No, the Word is the Father. Okay, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with the Father. Yes. And the Word was the Father. No. 
So the only way the doctrine of the Trinity works is if you change the definition of God in the middle of the verse. In the beginning was the Word, the, was, the word was with God, the first person, and the Word was God, the second person. But that's not right. You can't change the definition. You have to stick to the Old Testament definition. The Word was with God. The Word was God. It's the revelation of God. So John writes this book. In the first chapter, he says, I'm going to tell you what's going on. You're going to see the revelation of God. God revealing himself. And then if you go through all the, the, the book of John, he gives you these different signs. You know, Jesus is the light of the world. And he heals the blind man to show he's the light of the world. And, and so forth. Jesus is the bread of life. He feeds the 5,000. He demonstrates with a sign that he's the bread of life. So he gets to the end, and this is the climax of the whole book because chapter 21 is kind of like a, an appendix or an epilogue. It tells you about the main characters and what happens to them. But as far as the argument of the book, it ends right here. The last and greatest sign is his resurrection. And what does that prove? That he's my Lord and my God. You see, not only does Thomas confess this, but John confesses it because he puts it at the climax of the whole book. And then he ends in John 20, 31, after that story of Thomas confessing Jesus as Lord and God, in, in John chapter 20, verse 31, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And so John uses this as the final example in his book of who Jesus really is. So not only is Thomas confessing it, but John has been building up the whole time. And he gets to the climax and said, see, I told you, in the beginning was the Word. I told you that. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. Well, now I showed you that. Jesus is my Lord and my God. Who else could he be if he raised himself from the dead? He has to be God. So we have this powerful statement. Well, I can go on and on. I've mentioned uh, 2 Corinthians 5.19. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh. I was uh, in a seminar one time, and a well-known Trinitarian writer said, now if we want to be technically accurate with the Trinity, we need to stop saying God was manifest in the flesh. We need to say God the Son was manifest in the flesh. Because the Father was not manifest, the Holy Spirit, only one person, God the Son, was manifest with. I was so happy that I didn't have to change the words of Scripture to fit my doctrine, but I could just quote the words of Scripture as my doctrine. God was manifest in the flesh. Praise God. The Old Testament God, the one God, the only God, He was manifest in the flesh. Another verse, Titus 2.13, says we're looking for the appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Or other translations make it a little more clear from the Greek. Looking for the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, that's just a few examples of the scriptures that we can give. Let me go further. Jesus is the revelation of the Father. He is the manifestation of the Father in the flesh. Let's look at a few verses of Scripture. Well, of course, we already read one, Isaiah 9, 6. The child, unto us a child is born, son is given. And the name is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So the child, the son, is also the everlasting Father. There's another interesting uh, note in Isaiah chapter 63 in verse 16. Isaiah 63, in verse 16, Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, Jehovah, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. Our father is also our redeemer. Same one. When you come to the New Testament, we find some interesting statements. Let me... Go to John chapter 10 and verse 30. John chapter 10 and verse 30. 
Jesus was speaking to some Jews, and he said, I and my Father are one. Now, he was claiming identity with the Father. As an example, um, let's say you walked in here tonight. You never met me. You never saw me. You never saw any videos. You come up and say, I hear David Bernard supposed to be teaching here tonight. I say, yes, he's supposed to be here. Well, do, do you know what he looks like? Yes, I know what he looks like. Um, he's about my height, and uh, he's got uh, brown eyes and used to have brown hair. And <laughs> So we talked for a little longer, and uh, he said, well, 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 show me where he is. And I'll say, I'm speaking to you. I'm David Bernard. That's what Jesus was trying to do. He was telling these Jews, you worship God as an invisible spirit. You think you know the Father. And you're talking to me as a man, and you see no connection. But I, this man you're talking to, and the Father that you worship in heaven are not two as you suppose. I and the Father are one and the same. Now, you might say, well, why didn't Jesus say, I am the Father? Just make it really plain. I am the Father. Well... Because he was more than the Father. He was the Father in the Son. He was the Father revealed in flesh. You see, the Father is an invisible spirit. And the Jews understood that. If he would have said, I am the Father, they would have said, that's ridiculous. You, you're a man. We can see you. You can't be the Father. And so he didn't say, I am the Father. The Bible doesn't say it in that way. Because that would... That would uh, blur the distinctions that are there between spirit and flesh. But he says, I and the Father are one. Now some say, well, you know, husband and wife are one flesh. So Jesus was simply talking about agreement. No, he was talking about more than that. Let, let's go a little bit further. And I'll show you why. In the case of a husband and wife, we already know they're two persons. So when it say, says they become one then we know that doesn't mean one person, but it means agreement of two persons. But in the case of God, we know there's only one God. In John chapter 14, Jesus was talking to his disciples. John chapter 14, and uh, the famous verse in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But verse 7, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, ye know him and have seen him. Well, when he said, you've seen the Father, they couldn't understand that because they were thinking, the Father is invisible. And so Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. This is verse 8, and it suffices thus. Lord, if you will just let us see the Father one time, we'll be satisfied. You keep talking about the Father. You say we've seen the Father. We don't think we've seen the Father. Let us see him one time and we'll be happy. Well, if the Father were another person sitting up in heaven, Jesus could have said, well, let me give you a vision of him. Or wait till we get to heaven and I'll introduce you to him. But that's not what Jesus said. Notice in verse 9, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Philip, you know God is invisible. How are you going to see the Father? The only way you will see the Father with your human eyes is if the Father manifests himself in some visible way. Now, Philip, think about what I have done. You've seen me raise the dead. Who can do that but God? You've seen me forgive sins. Who can do that but God? You've seen me calm the storm and walk on water. Who can control nature except God? You've seen me feed 5,000 with just uh, five loaves and two fish. Who can create things except God? You've seen me cast out demons by my own authority. Who am I? I'm, I am the manifestation of the Father. And when you see me, you see the Father in the only way that human eyes will ever see the Father. If you can't believe what I'm saying, believe the works that I've done, and then you'll know. 
that the Father dwells in me. It's a very plain statement. Now, it means more than oneness of two persons because he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, my wife is here tonight. We're married. Today, we've been married 24 years. Today is our anniversary. We were out shopping this afternoon, and a lady came up and says, Oh, you're so pretty. You're so beautiful. So if you see me, you haven't seen my wife. We're one. We're one flesh. But I can't say, if you've seen me, you've seen my wife. And I promise you, I will never say, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but my wife that dwelleth in me, she doeth the works. So Jesus was talking about more than unity. He was talking about identity. Praise God. You know, back in John 10, the, the Jews understood that because when he said, I and my father one, they said, they took up stones to kill him. He said, for which of my good works are you going to stone me? They said, not for your good works, but because you, being a man, make yourself God. They understood the claim, but they couldn't accept it. And as Jews, they weren't saying, you're making yourself another God. They were saying, we all agree there's only one God. You're claiming to be the one God. And we can't accept that. Their problem was this. He wasn't a man trying to make himself God. He was God who made himself man. Praise God. So... Jesus is the revelation of the Father. You know, I've talked to Trinitarian ministers, as I told you, and one that's very effective. I say, you know, you're Trinitarian. Let's think about it. When you go to heaven, who are you going, who are you going to see? And a lot of times they, they cannot give an answer. I say, if you, if you think, I said, we all agree when we go to heaven, we'll see Jesus, right? Everybody agrees on that. Okay, let's say we go to heaven, we see Jesus, we worship Him, we praise Him, we love Him. And then after a while, somebody says, okay, Jesus, it's very good to see you. Now I'd like to see your father. What's he going to say? His word is forever settled in heaven. His word never changes. He would have to give the same answer that he gave Philip. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Praise the Lord. All right, what about the Holy Spirit? If we go into this same chapter just a little bit later, John chapter 14, verse 16 through verse 18. Let's look at this carefully. John chapter 14, verse 16. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now, if we stop right here, it says another comforter. We might think another person. But keep reading. Whenever you get into a difficult scripture, one of the best things to do to understand it is to keep reading. Read before and after. Get the whole context and you'll understand it. Verse 17, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. Here he is again telling them they already know. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So this Holy Spirit, the comforter or the helper, is already dwelling with you. You already know him. So who was already dwelling with them? Of course, Jesus. But he said he dwells with you, but he shall be in you. So when he says another comforter, he does not mean another person but he means another form and another relationship. You see, right now he's with you. The difference is he will be in you. Right now he's in flesh, but the difference is he will be in spirit. So not another person. When he says another comforter, he does not mean another person. It's someone they already know, but it's a different form in spirit rather than flesh and a different relationship in you rather than with you. You see, while Jesus was with them on earth, when they had a dispute, 
they could come to Jesus and he could solve their problem. When they were sick, he could lay hands on them and heal them. But they would have to come to his physical presence. But he's saying there's going to be a change. When I leave and go away, I will send back my spirit to dwell within you. That wherever you go, you'll have my spirit. So it's a new relationship, and I will be there to comfort you. Now, to make it even more clear, let's read the next verse, verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And there it's very clear. The Holy Spirit is actually the Spirit of Jesus coming back to comfort his disciples. And to make it even more interesting, the word comfortless in the Greek is the Greek word orphanos, O-R-P-H-A-N-O-S. It's the same word from which we get the English word orphan. He's literally saying, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Well, if we're not going to be orphans because of his presence, then what does that mean that he is to us? He is our Father. So he's saying, when I come back as the Holy Spirit inside of you, you're going to have both the Father and the Son. Not as two different persons. But when we have the Spirit of Jesus inside of us, the Holy Spirit, we have the power of the Father, the creative power of the universe, the God who said, let there be light, can speak into our lives and say, let there be light. But we also have the Spirit of the Son. Because when Jesus walked on earth, He was humble. He was obedient. He did the will of God. You don't think when God says, let there be light, you don't think of humility and obedience. But when you think of Jesus walking on earth, you think of humility and be obedience. So we have the Spirit of the Father and the Son. Not as two different spirits, but as one Spirit. But we have both the Father and the Son in our lives when we receive the one Spirit of God. Isn't that beautiful? And so Jesus could explain here who the Holy Spirit is. So Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the revelation of the Father. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. If the Holy Spirit is not Jesus in spirit form, then the promises of Jesus did not come true. For example, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. We're gathered in Jesus' name, but where is Jesus? He's not here physically, but he's here in spirit. If the Holy Spirit is not Jesus in spirit form, then that promise is not true. I was talking to a group of Trinitarian ministers. I was meeting with them. And uh, I said, the Holy Spirit is a spirit of Jesus coming to dwell in the lives of believers. The very spirit that was in Jesus when he walked on work, earth is coming to, to dwell in our lives. And they says, no, we cannot, we cannot accept that. I said, because that denies the Trinity. I said, okay, let's say we tonight we gather and pray. And we feel the presence of God, right? Who is that, what, who is that going to be? Is that going to be Jesus or is that the Holy Spirit? If you, if you say, Jesus, then when do you ever feel the Holy Spirit? If you say the Holy Spirit, when does Jesus ever come? Are you going to tell me that on one side of the room is the Holy Spirit, the other side is Jesus? What are you going to tell me? And the only answer they would give is, we do not talk in those categories. I said, well, tell me, is the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Jesus, yes or no? Well, we don't, we don't think in those terms. I said, well, there's the answer. And once you decide, that will be your answer. But as for me, I know sh for sure that Jesus promised to be with us. And it's by His Spirit that He fulfills that promise. So we understand that God is our Father. We understand that God came in flesh as the Son of God. And we understand that God is the Holy Spirit. But we also understand that Jesus is the revelation of the fullness of God. So the Father is manifested to this world in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. And therefore, the one name 
of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is Jesus. I was debating a, a, a minister on this, and I said in Matthew 28, 19, it says the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, singular. What's the one name of Father, Son, and the Spirit? He had a hard time figuring that out. And because he finally said, well, God. I said, well, if it's God, the word God is generic. You know, the Muslims worship God. Uh, different religions, they worship God. That's just a generic term, a general term of deity. But when you identify the God you worship as opposed to other religions, he has to have a name. What's his name? When the Old Testament, you can say Jehovah, that would be true. But in the New Testament, there's a new name revealed that incorporates the name Jehovah, but it adds new revelation. That's the name of Jesus. Because the name of Jesus actually means Jehovah Savior. It means Jehovah has become my Savior. And so it doesn't take away the name of Jehovah, but it includes it and adds a new revelation. And therefore, according to Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's the name of Jesus. It's the highest name. It's the one name that reveals God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at the same time. So when we get to heaven, who are we going to see? We're going to see Jesus. We're not going to see three persons if... If somebody says, well, we'll see three different persons in three different bodies, then that's three gods. You can say three in one, but if you're going to see three different personal beings with three different bodies, then that's three gods. If you go out in the street and ask non-Christians, and they say, okay, here's a picture of three men. How, how many is that? One or three? Every one of us is going to say three. And when we say, that's my God. How many do I have? They're going to say three. Everybody understands that. If you say you believe in one God, you can't say I'm going to go to heaven and see three different bodies. Now, if you're only going to see one, who is that one? Well, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Colossians 1.15. So the answer is you're going to see Jesus. When you see Him, you're going to be in relationship to Him you're going to know Him as your Father revealed in flesh. You're going to feel the same Spirit that we can feel tonight, only in a greater dimension. You're going to feel the Holy Spirit, but you're going to see Jesus. I'll briefly show you this. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. We have a, a vision of heaven. And notice... Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So there's one divine throne in heaven, and there's one sitting on that throne. Now, verse 8, here's a description of that one. The four beasts had each of them six wings about him. They were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Now that's who's on the throne. He's called Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is and was and is to come. Now go back to Revelation chapter 1 and you will find out who that is speaking about. In Revelation 1, beginning in verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Now, who is that talking about? It's got to be Jesus. Every eye is going to see him. He was pierced. That's Jesus. But Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, here Jesus speaks. I am Alpha and Omega. That's the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So in Revelation 1.8, Jesus uses the same description for himself as the one on the throne in Revelation 4.8. He is the one on the throne. If you're not 
clear about that if you go down to Revelation 1, 17 and 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So who is alive? He was dead. He's alive forevermore. That's Jesus. And he's called the first and the last. The beginning and the ending. The Alpha and Omega. So he is the one who fits the description of the one on the throne. Now, in Revelation 5, we have a lamb in the midst of the throne. And the lamb comes out of the throne and takes the book of redemption from the one on the throne. So sometimes the Trinitarians will say, well, here are two persons. But obviously this is symbolic. It's a vision. When we go to heaven, we don't expect to see a lamb walking around, right? So we know that's not a vision that's supposed to be a literal physical reality but the lamb is christ in his sacrificial role the lamb was slain revelation says and there again you see the symbolism the lamb was killed but yet it's walking around and the lamb has seven eyes which are the seven spirits of god seven is the number of perfection it means the fullness of god's spirit well, if this is talking about the Trinity, then the second person, the Trinity, has the third person, the Trinity, belonging to him. But that's not true. It's talking about Jesus Christ. The Lamb is Jesus in his sacrificial role. The one on the throne is talking about God, Jesus, as King of kings and Lord of lords. You see, the Bible says the Lamb is in the midst of the throne, literally on the center of the throne. So you have a picture of one who's on the throne. The lamb comes out of the throne. And the lamb comes back to the throne. And the lamb has never left the throne. That is the only way you could describe what God did in Christ. Because when Christ died for our sins, you can't say heaven was empty. God was still God. His spirit still filled the universe. He was still giving direction to his angels. I don't think there were two visible bodies of God, but I think God was still being God while Christ was God manifest in the flesh on earth. So the only way you could describe that is this vision of a lamb coming out of the throne. What it's showing is our God became the sacrifice for our sins, but he didn't stop being God. So it's a vision that shows the incarnation and the atonement. Now, to put this all together, if that sounds strange to you, I'll put it all together in closing here. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 3 through 4, and this is a vision of eternity to come. This is what we're going to, going to see in heaven. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Notice one throne, the throne of God and of the Lamb. And it's not talking about two persons sitting on one throne. It's not talking about one person sitting in another person's lap. It's one person sitting on the throne. Because it says, his servant, singular, shall serve him. So one person is God and the Lamb at the same time. Who is both the sovereign and the sacrifice at the same time? Who is both deity and humanity at the same time? Who is both God and the Lamb at the same time? It's only Jesus. And they shall see His face. Whose face is the image of the invisible God? Jesus. And His name shall be in their foreheads. Who has the highest name? The name of Jesus. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. God has given him a name which is above every name. And so in eternity to come, we're going to see Jesus on the throne as God manifested in the flesh. He's going to be God and the Lamb at the same time. And the beautiful message of it is, I read you Colossians 2, 9, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Verse 10, and ye are complete in him. Now, we need to study 
more and more about the truth of the oneness of God and the identity of Christ. But the beautiful thing is, somebody could come in here for the first time. Maybe they're Buddhist, maybe they're Hindu, maybe they're Muslim. I've personally baptized Muslims and seen in Jesus' name and seen them receive the Holy Ghost in our local church. We've seen Buddhists receive the Holy Ghost. We've seen, we've seen uh, uh, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, agnostics or atheists. We've seen them all come into our church, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. I've baptized former Hindus in Jesus' name in our church in Austin, Texas. And I know by experience that this is true. But someone could come here. They may not understand all the scriptures we've given. They may not understand Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Trinity, Oneness. Um, may not be able to explain various verses. But if we preach the simple message, Jesus died for your sins. He's God manifested in the flesh to be your Savior. Do you know what? They know enough to repent. If all you know is Jesus, you can repent of your sins. If all you know is Jesus, we can baptize you in Jesus' name. If all you know is Jesus, you can receive the Holy Spirit. If all you know is Jesus, you can be healed in your body. If all you know is Jesus, you can get direction for your life. If all you know is Jesus, you can get strength. Because we are complete in Him. Let's stand right now and let's give God the praise. Brother Willoughby, come close this out. Let's praise the Lord together, shall we? Thank you, Jesus, for the revelation of truth. Thank you, Lord, for the message of the oneness of God, the Almighty God in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that we know who you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Continue to worship Him. Hallelujah. Continue to praise Him. Hallelujah. And the power, hallelujah, of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, Jesus. We praise you for the revelation, hallelujah, and the understanding, hallelujah, that you are the mighty God in Christ, hallelujah. I believe, how long ago did you write the oneness of God? And that, uh, I read it that year. So that's 24 years. 24 years ago, I thought you were good. 24 years ago, I was impressed. I was impressed again when I saw your teaching through Kent Christian College. And uh, when Sister Trout helped us to get those lessons, it was it was a wonderful thing. It was, Brother Bernard, the first time that we had Bible study. Brother Amos, Sister We Are, Brother Timothy, I don't remember if there was anyone else, had a little group of young people. And we sat down and we watched you teaching the oneness of God. I thought you was good then, but God's made you a lot better. <laughs> this is so simple and yet so powerful. I am convinced that there are multitudes of people that would embrace this truth if they but heard it clearly articulated. We could, we, we could do a lot of honoring of Brother Bernard, and he would deserve all of that. But the greatest tribute that we can give to him is if we will learn what he taught tonight and if we will individually be able to share. Brother Stone King told us that the secret to have an apostolic revival is to fill the city with apostolic doctrine. 
I'm asking you before you leave here, those of you that believe this, I'm asking you to make a commitment that you will be able, that you are going to teach this. Brother Bernard, these young people have something. They, their, their goal this year is give Jesus five. And what that means is that they have been challenged to teach five home Bible studies, each one of them to teach five Bible studies. I'm anxious to sit down and go through what I heard tonight. I want to digest it. I want to be able to repeat it and give it to someone. I want to feel this city with the Apostles' Doctrine. I want to feel this 1040 window. I want everyone in China and in India to hear. I want the multitudes of millions in Indonesia to have an opportunity to know that Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah, if this is your desire. Hallelujah, would you reach out to Him? Hallelujah, this truth, hallelujah, is not powerful except when it's told, when it's shared. Hallelujah, when you become a witness, when you become a testimony. Hallelujah, when it becomes alive in your heart and life so much that you fulfill the commission and the command of Matthew 28, 19. That when you begin to go into all of the world hallelujah into all of the world telling that jesus is lord hallelujah that we make the declar declaration of thomas you are lord and god you are my messiah and my heavenly father you are the one and the only the great i am robed in flesh hallelujah come to continue to praise him for a moment Hallelujah. 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 Pray right now that Singapore would experience a revelation. Hallelujah. Of power and of truth. Hallelujah. Pray. Hallelujah. That this would spread. Hallelujah. That this. Hallelujah. Ha, hallelujah. So worship I. Hallelujah. If this is heresy, then I'm a heretic. Hallelujah. But this is that. Hallelujah. That the prophet said, this is the revelation. Mm. Hallelujah. You are God's chosen. You are God's chosen. You are God's chosen. You are here by absolute Hallelujah. Design. Hallelujah. You were brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. You were brought into the kingdom to be bold, to proclaim the Lord's name. Hallelujah. To be witnesses. Hallelujah. Of His majesty, of His doctrine and His truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why we are compelled to look different, to act different, to talk different, to be different. We are the people of His name. We are the people whom He has chosen before the foundations of the earth that we might bear His name in this generation. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 I'd love to meet Abraham. I would love to had to talk to Jacob and to Isaac. I'd love to spend some time with the prophets of old. But I don't want to live in their day. I am so glad that Jesus chose me to be, hallelujah, His Son in this last generation. That He has entrusted to me. Hallelujah. That in the hour of the greatest human need, that He would raise up a people for His name. Jesus, let this truth, hallelujah, be upon us, in us. Hallelujah. Let it flow out from us. Hallelujah. Let us tonight, tomorrow, let us ruminate on this. Hallelujah. Let us meditate upon what we have heard.
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Do you think you might know someone that if they heard this, they would consider themselves blessed? Do you think that you work with someone, that you go to school with someone, that if someone heard the beauty... Not one time did Brother Bernard say, well, it's a mystery and you can't understand it. What, what I know about the Bible is Jesus doesn't play hide and seek. God doesn't play hide and seek. He's not into hiding. He's into revealing. And so... He has no pleasure in being a mystery that is so complicated that you can't figure it out. He's into simplicity. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Hallelujah. Jesus, we thank you for your word that has been shared with us tonight. Hallelujah. We ask that your blessings would be upon your servants, brother and sister Bernard, that you would give them rest tonight. Hallelujah. God, we thank you for what has been shared. Hallelujah. In our, to our lives tonight. God, we make a commitment to you. We understand that we were born for such a time as this and that you have called us into your kingdom. Hallelujah. To be bold witnesses. Hallelujah. To have, have that bold for us see a boldness. Hallelujah. That come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, with your spirit that we might be, hallelujah, witnesses and testify of your majesty and glory. Bring us back, God, tomorrow, hallelujah, but let the crowd multiply, hallelujah, let by our testimony, hallelujah, by our sharing, by the excitement with which, hallelujah, that we declare your majesty and glory, let people be attracted into this place, let your spirit go forth from here, hallelujah, those, God, hallelujah, they that are determined, hallelujah, that you have determined to bring into the house of faith. Let your spirit, God, go across this island to the north and the south, to the east and to the west. Hallelujah. Let our mouths, God, be tools and witnesses of your spirit to speak, God, that we might join together with you. Hallelujah. Our mouth, our desire, hallelujah, with the power of your spirit to find hungry souls. Give us divine appointments tomorrow. Give us divine opportunities, God. Appointments, hallelujah, of yours by your spirit that we might testify, hallelujah, of your greatness and of the power of your name. In Jesus' name, amen.